Hello, everybody, and welcome into the Bible Reading Podcast, episode number 329. Today's big Bible question, was Jesus universally beloved except by the religious leaders? Well, happy Friday to you, friends. I'm not going to lie to you. Today's podcast might be a little different, a little strange, a little odd, but I think it lands in a good area, so hopefully it will be meaningful to you. Today we will be reading 1 Chronicles 15, Amos chapter 9, Luke chapter 4, and James chapter 2. It will not surprise you at all that our Chronicles passage is filled with hard-to-pronounce names like Cushaiah, Shemiramoth, and Alephalihu that are really quite difficult for this old boy from Alabama to pronounce properly. Sometimes I think the chronicler is just messing with us and throwing in a few tongue twister names on purpose. Well, I don't really think that. I'm just kidding. Our discussion today is centered around Luke chapter 4, which has easier to read names in it. As we've discussed recently, there are some definite opinions about who killed Jesus. Some people think the Jews killed Jesus. Some people think the Romans killed Jesus. Some people think religious people killed Jesus. And some think the privileged or the 1% killed Jesus. And of course, they're all right, but they're not exclusively right, as we'll find out today when a surprising group of people tried to kill Jesus. And when I say they tried, I mean they would have absolutely succeeded had God not miraculously rescued Jesus. And I guess I should say, that they would have succeeded had it not been his time. Because when Jesus uh, is about to be crucified, he says, I lay down my life. And that really says to me that he allowed it to happen. And in this particular case, he didn't allow it to happen. So there's that. Well, let's read Luke 4. And I guess you can see what I can talk about because it's really one of the the more interesting passages in Scripture, not very talked about. And if you kind of picture it while I'm reading, it'll give you sort of an astounding picture of this incident in the life of Jesus. Luke chapter 4, verse 1 in the Christian Standard Bible. Then Jesus left the Jordan full of the Holy Spirit and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days to be tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were over, he was hungry. The devil devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, It is written, Man must, must not live on bread alone. So he took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you their splendor and all this authority because it has been given over to me and I can give it to anyone I want. If you then will worship me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So he took him to Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down here, for it is written, He will give his angels orders concerning you to protect you, and they will support you with their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, It is said, Do not test the Lord your God. After the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him for a time. Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the entire vicinity. He was preaching in their synagogues, being praised by everyone. He came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. And they were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, Isn't this Joseph's son? Then he said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Doctor, heal yourself. What we've heard that took place in Capernaum do here in your hometown also. He also said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's days when the sky was shut up for three years and six months while a great famine came over the land. 
Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except a widow at Zarephath and Sidon. And in the prophet Elisha's time, there were many in Israel who had leprosy, and yet not one of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, drove him out of town, and brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on, intending it to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbath. They were astonished at his teaching because his message had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man with an unclean demonic spirit who cried out with a loud voice, Leave us alone. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him and said, Be silent and come out of him. And throwing him down before them, the demon came out of him without hurting him at all. Amazement came over them all, and they were saying to one another, What is this message? For he commands the unclean spirits with authority and power, and they come out. And news about him began to go out to every place in the vicinity. After he left the synagogue, he entered Simon's house. Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him about her. So he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up immediately and began to serve them. When the sun was setting, all those who had anyone sick with various diseases brought them to him. As he laid his hands on each one of them, he healed them. Also, demons were coming out of many, shouting and saying, You are the Son of God! But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Messiah. When it was day, he went out and made his way to a deserted place, but the crowds were searching for him. They came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them, But he said to them, It is necessary for me to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God to other towns also, because I was sent for this purpose. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Well, your first question in this passage might be kind of similar to mine. Given that, quote, all the people were speaking well of Jesus, why did Jesus push these particular hometown Israelites so hard? I pondered that one for a while. But I think Luke gives us the answer without spelling it out completely for us. So consider what I'm about to say. Speculation. Luke 4.22, they were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, isn't this Joseph's son? Well, what does that mean exactly? Well, I think it means that they were taking Jesus to be a mere human, a good teacher with a surprising knowledge of scripture, but merely human. Joseph, the carpenter's son, untrained, unschooled, unremarkable, except for his knowledge of scripture. They clearly thought well of him and thought he was a good teacher. And Jesus confronted them for that because Jesus was not merely a good teacher. He was far beyond that. And he knew that them viewing him as merely a good teacher would help them nothing. It would avail them nothing. So Jesus strongly challenges them, I think revealing sinful racism and nationalism in their heart, which absolutely enrages them, these good, salt-of-the-earth, patriotic people who were of Jesus' hometown. How do they react to this? Well, violently and with murderous anger, really. As I mentioned earlier, I'm a child of the South, living over 40 years in Birmingham, Alabama, which was one of the epicenters for the civil rights movement in the United States. I was raised in the kind of atmosphere where my parents got phone calls of alarm and complaint when an African-American friend of mine uh, came over to play with me after school in the front yard when we were like eight. Can you imagine like white people calling my parents to complain about Uh, A black kid and a white kid playing in their front yard. They were upset about that. Now, that was, I don't know, 1981 or something like that. And I think Birmingham is doing better and better, especially among younger people. But honestly, I would never presume to speak too authoritatively about the racism situation in the South because I can't see it clearly enough because I'm not a person of color. One thing I can speak confidently of, when racist people get called out for their racism... They get angry, like sometimes really, really violently angry. Almost nobody thinks they're racist because almost everybody knows somebody more racist than themselves. Uh, And they assume that the worst person that they know is the real racist. Now, I don't suggest you do this, but you can find dozens, if not hundreds of videos online of people saying just horrible and blatantly racist things to 
other people of color, and in the same breath vehemently denying that they are racist. This dynamic should make all of us examine our hearts, and it would appear that Jesus saw some level of racism here amongst the people of his hometown. Maybe it's nationalism, maybe it's a combination of racism, but whatever it was, Jesus challenged them on it. And he didn't challenge them by saying, oh, you guys are a bunch of racists, uh, which is all, almost always not going to bring about change, like insulting somebody to open their eyes is not going to bring about heart change. What Jesus did was he shared things from the word of God that revealed their racist hearts and their hatred or their nationalistic hearts and their hatred. So you see it in verse 25, I say to you, there are certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's days when the sky was shut up for three years and six months while a great famine came over all the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except a widow at Zarephath and Sidon. And in Elisha's time, the only leper that was cleansed was Naaman the Syrian from another country. Well, why would Jesus do that? Well, I think, again, speculation alert, I think part of the answer is that Jesus was preparing his fellow countrymen the Israelites who thought that they were only God's people, perhaps they were up until that time, but Jesus was preparing them for something different. The expansion of the kingdom of God through the gospel that would spill way out beyond the borders of Israel. Because while Jesus was indeed sent to the lost sheep of Israel, he would send his disciples to the ends of the earth. And notice the reaction of those who had previously just Minutes before, been speaking so well of Jesus. When they heard this challenge from Jesus, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, pushed Jesus out of town, literally bringing Tim to the edge of a cliff that they were going to toss him off of, but they were unable to. He just walked right between them. Now, why were they unable to? Well, He was God, and nobody could do anything to Jesus that he didn't let them do. The thing about it is, if Jesus had wanted to resist the Romans that put him on the cross, he would have. He had the power to. That would have been nothing to him. He would have easily done it. But he didn't. He allowed himself to be killed. He said, as as I mentioned earlier, I lay my life down. And that's the thing. Jesus just walked through them because it wasn't time. I got to tell you, to be honest with you, this is one of the the top 10 things in the Bible I would have loved to see in person. It seems like maybe a dramatic escape or something, and Luke downplays it just about as much as you possibly could. You know, Luke just says, well, he just walked away, (laughs) which is so funny. And it sort of reveals how reliable Luke is. He's an excellent historian. He's honest. He's not dramatizing these events or exaggerating. He's just, he may even be under exaggerating them. And so that makes him an excellent historian, if not an excellent Michael Bay-esque movie screenwriter, which we don't want for the Bible, right? We want accuracy. So I have this book written by a guy named Dan Kimball, who I just recently found out is a pastor like 30 minutes away from me. I've had I've had this book for like, I don't know, 15 years. It's one of my favorites. It's called They Like Jesus, But Not the Church. It's a very insightful book, and and it's had a lot of impact on me. It's written on the premise that everybody likes Jesus, but a lot of people struggle with religious and churchy people. And you know what? That's true up to a point. It's absolutely true that Jesus drew the kind of the people that the church repels, prostitutes, criminals, the least of these, etc. But here... In this passage, we do see something that should challenge the view that every common person loves Jesus, and it's only the elites and the religious leaders that don't. Here we see an episode of common, everyday, probably blue-collar, salt-of-the-earth kind of country people being confronted over their sin, and they're enraged at Jesus so much that they literally tried to kill him in that moment, and they would have. If would have if he wasn't, you know, the son of God. Uh, they tried to kill the preacher in their church that morning. Now, look, I've seen people upset at a sermon, but I've guessed people have been upset at my sermons, but nobody has ever taken a swing at me, much less literally tried to kill me. Well, why did they do that in this situation? Well, 
I think a big part of it is because Jesus called them out on their sin and they hated him for it. And here's the thing. Jesus is all loving. He's kinder than any person ever born. He's gentle. He's meek. He's humble. He's absolutely and utterly amazing in every way. But he is not a cuddly teddy bear. Yes, Jesus is bursting with love, but he's also bursting with holiness. And he called people... He called people, both the elites and the poorest of the poor, the religious leaders and the least of these that were despised by the holier than thou's. He called all people to repent of their sins, take up their cross, and follow him. And that is still his call. So what's the point? Well, I guess the point of today is that we are all guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus because he died for our sins to pay the price for us. The point is also that Jesus confronts all of our, all of us bidding us to turn away from our sins and turn to him as Lord and Savior. We definitely want to be saved, so we want a Savior, but probably most don't want to surrender to a Lord, nor do most want to be confronted by Jesus for our sins. So Jesus came as a prophet, a priest, and a king. As a priest, his death on the cross reconciles and brings us together with God the Father, opening the door to eternal life in heaven. And boy, that's great, fantastic, wonderful, and welcome. Who wouldn't cheer for something like that? But as a prophet, hmm, he points to our sins and calls us both lovingly and powerfully with all authority to turn away from those sins and turn to him. Now, this is for our ultimate good, and it's a good thing, but it can be difficult, maybe even enraging sometimes, to say the least. And yet, he is also king, not just any king either, not merely the president of the largest country in the world. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Of all the kings anywhere in existence, he is the king of all of them and the king of everybody else. And he's not safe, calling us to follow him to places we might not always want to go calling us to lay down thoughts and actions that we may want to hang on to. But you know what? He's the king. I'll close with a small snippet from The Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe. When Mr. Beaver is describing Aslan the Lion to the four Pevensi children who have stumbled into the kingdom of Narnia. If you're not familiar with The Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe, all you need to know is that Aslan is a type of Jesus. And this is one of the best descriptions of Jesus and who he is. His, in Narnia, his name is Aslan. And, the, and Mr. Beaver says, Aslan is a lion, the lion, the great lion. Oh, said Susan, I'd thought Aslan was a man. Is he quite safe? I should feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Well, that is a profound description of Jesus, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. No, he's not safe, but boy, is he good. And he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Well, today hasn't been a neat and clean uh, podcast with a quick and easy point that you can take away and remember. It's been more of a rambling bit of meditation that I think, at least hopefully, is good for us to hear and maybe challenging for us to hear and good for us to remember. Jesus is both a friend of sinners and a confronter of sinners. All hail King Jesus. We continue with First Chronicles chapter 15, verse 1. David built houses for himself in the city of God, and he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said, No one but the Levites may carry the ark of God, because the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister before him forever. David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring the ark of the Lord to the place he had prepared for it. Then he gathered together the descendants of Aaron and the Levites from the Kohathites, Uriel the leader and 120 of his relatives from the Merarites, Asiah, the leader, and 220 of his relatives, from the Gershomites, Joel, the leader, and 130 of his relatives, from the Elezaphanites, Shemaiah, the leader, and 200 of his relatives, from the Hebronites, Eliel, the leader, and 80 of his relatives, from the Utsielites, Amenadab, the leader, and 112 of his relatives. David summoned the priests Zadok and Abiathar, and the Levites, Uriel, Isaiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel and Amenadab, and he said to them, You are the heads of the Levite families. You and your relatives must consecrate yourselves 
so that you may bring the ark of the Lord of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. For the Lord our God burst out in anger against us because you Levites were not with us the first time, for we didn't inquire of him about the proper procedures. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel. Then the Levites carried the ark of God the way Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord, on their shoulders with the poles. Then David told the leaders of the Levites to appoint their relatives as singers and to have them raise their voices with joy accompanied by musical instruments, harps, lyres, and cymbals. So the Levites appointed Heman, son of Joel, from his relatives, Asaph, son of Barakiah, and from their relatives, the Merorites, Ethan, son of Cushiah. With them were their relatives in the second rank, Zechariah, Jotziel, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Uni, Eliab, Benaiah, Masaiah, Mattathiah, Elephalehu, Mikniah, and the gatekeepers Obed-Edom and Jael. The singers Heman, Asaph, and Ethan were to sound the bronze cymbals, Zechariah, Atziel, Shemiramoth, Jehiel, Uni, Eliab, Masaiah, and Benaiah were to play harps according to Alamoth, and Mattathiah, Elephaliu, Mechniah, Obed Edom, Jael, and Azaz- Azaziah were to lead the music with lyres according to the Sheminith. Chenaniah, the leader of the Levites in music, was to direct the music because he was skillful. Barakiah and Elkanah were to be gatekeepers for the ark. The priests Shebaniah, Josaphat, Nethanel, Amasai, Zechariah, Benaniah, and Eleazar were to blow trumpets before the Ark of God. Obed-Edom and Jehaiah were also to be gatekeepers for the Ark. David, the elders of Israel, and the commanders of thousands went with rejoicing to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom. Because God helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with the Lord's help, They sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. Now David was dressed in a robe of fine linen, as were all of the Levites who were carrying the ark, as well as the singers and Chenaniah, the music leader of the singers. David also wore a linen ephod, so all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with shouts, the sound of the ram's horn, trumpets and cymbals, and the playing of harps and lyres. As the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord was entering the city of David, Saul's daughter, Michal, looked down from the window and saw King David leaping and dancing, and she despised him in her heart. Amos chapter 9, verse 1. I saw the Lord standing beside the altar, and he said, Strike the capitals of the pillars so that the thresholds shake. Knock them down on the heads of all the people, then I will kill the rest of them with the sword. None of those who flee will get away. None of the fugitives will escape. If they dig down to Sheol, from there my hands will take them. If they climb up to heaven, from there I will bring them down. If they hide on the top of Carmel, from there I will track them down and seize them. If they conceal themselves from my sight on the sea floor, from there I will command the sea serpent to bite them. And if they are driven by their enemies into captivity, from there I will command the sword to kill them. I will keep my eye on them. For harm and not for good, the Lord, the God of armies, he touches the earth, it melts, and all who dwell in it mourn. All of it rises like the Nile and subsides like the Nile of Egypt. He builds his upper chambers in the heavens and lays the foundation of his vault on the earth. He summons the water of the sea and pours it out over the surface of the earth. The Lord is his name. Israelites, are you not like the Cushites to me? This is the Lord's declaration. Didn't I bring Israel from the land of Egypt, the Philistines from Kaftor, and the Arameans from Kir? Look, the eyes of the Lord God are on this sinful kingdom, and I will obliterate it from the face of the earth. However, I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob. This is the Lord's declaration, for I am about to give the command, and I will shake the house of Israel among all the nations as one shakes a sieve, but not a pebble will fall to the ground. All the sinners among my people who say disaster will never overtake or confront us will will die by the sword. In that day, I will restore the fallen shelter of David. I will repair its gaps, restore its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name. This is the declaration of the Lord. He will do this. Look, the days are coming. This is the Lord's declaration. When the plowman will overtake the reaper and the one who treads grapes, the sower of seed, the mountains will drip with sweet wine and all of the hills will flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel 
They will rebuild and occupy ruined cities, plant vineyards and drink their wine, make gardens and eat their produce. I will plant them on their land and they will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them. The Lord your God has spoken. Finally, James chapter 2, verse 1. My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if someone comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes, and a poor person dressed in filthy clothes also comes in, if you look with favor on the one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor person, stand over there, or sit here on the floor by my footstool, Haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, didn't God choose the poor in this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him, yet you have dishonored the poor? Didn't the rich oppress you and drag you into court? Don't they blaspheme the good name that was invoked over you? Indeed, if you fulfill the law, royal law, prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the entire law and yet stumbles at one point is guilty of breaking it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. So if you do not commit adultery but you murder, you are a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of freedom. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but does not have works? Can such faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without works, and I will show you faith by my works. You believe that God is one? Good. Even the demons believe and they shudder. Senseless person, are you willing to learn that faith without works is useless? Wasn't Abraham our father justified by works in offering Isaac his son on the altar? You see that faith was active together with his works and by works faith was made complete and the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, wasn't Rahab the prostitute also justified by works in receiving the messengers and sending them out by a different route? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Amen. Well, friends, may your faith in Jesus produce great works for his glory. May his hand be blessing you and his face shine in your direction. Good day to you and Godspeed.